James are also counselors on Wednesday night. But anyhow, I'd like to invite you here on Wednesday night. If you're not moved by that video series, uh, something, something's out of order. Because it's powerful. It's setting the setting of, a, of, of what would probably be in Jesus' day. It's a very powerful study. So I'd like to encourage you to be here Wednesday night. And we'll begin the study at 7 o'clock. We have a prayer time at 6.30. But at 7 o'clock we begin our, our Bible study and like the privilege of Let's all stand as we read the scriptures together. I want to talk to you this morning from the foundations of the world. Revelation chapter 13. And the dragon stood on the sand of the seashore. Then I saw a beast coming up out of the sea having ten horns and seven heads, and on his horns were ten diadems. And on his heads were blasphemous names. And the beast which I saw was like a leopard, and his feet were like those of a bear, and his mouth like the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power and his throne and great authority. I saw one of the heads that had been slain, and his fatal wound was healed, and the whole earth was amazed and followed after the beast. They worshipped the dragon, because he gave his authority to the beast, and they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like the beast, and who is able to wage war with him? There was given to him a mouth speaking arrogant words and blasphemes, and authority to act for 42 months was given to him. And he opened his mouth in blaspheme against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle, that is, those who dwell in heaven. It was also given to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. Now, pay close attention to that. And to overcome them. And authority over every tribe and people and tongue and nation was given to him. All who dwell on the earth will worship him. Everyone whose name has not been written from the foundations of the world in the book of life of the Lamb who has been slain. If anyone has an ear, let him hear. If anyone is destined or for captive, captivity, to captivity he goes. If anyone kills with a sword, with a sword he must be killed. Here is a perseverance and the faith. God has blessed you. Let me see you. Four Sundays. Just four Sundays. Can you believe that from now? We're going to be celebrating the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It, it almost seems like we just finished Christmas. Amen? Man, time is fine. But anyhow, four Sundays from now, we're going to, to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But Long before Jesus was crucified, long before Jesus laid down his life on that cross for you and I, God had already determined that that would take place. Now I know in, in the New American Standard Version it reads, you know, from the in verse eight it says from the foundations of you know whose name is written from the foundations of the word and the book of life and the Lamb has been slain. In the Greek, as you read the Greek, it's the, the emphasis is given to the Lamb which was slain before the foundations of the world. Jesus was slain. Even before you and I were even thought about by our mom and dad, Jesus had given his life, given his, given his life for you. I love reading the Old Testament. And as you read the Old Testament, you'll get glimpses of Jesus' crucifixion from the prophet and the psalmist. Isaiah 53 talks about the suffering Savior and what Jesus goes through as the sacrificial lamb of God. And then you go over to Psalms 22, and the very first verse, the very first verse of Psalms 22 says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And it talks also about his garments, you know, being gambled for. How do they know that? God had already determined that. God had already planned that. Even before he created this world. And that company, you know, 
And that, that's God had already made preparations for you to be saved. Now, that's a wonderful thought. That's how much love He has towards us. Even before He created creation, He had you in mind. We come to the book of, of Revelation, and, and it's a very interesting book it's of the Bible. Some people like it or don't like it, and say that some people don't like it because of the strong symbolism which it uses to describe uh, prophetic uh, utterances or, or the end times. Others are fascinated with it because it's a mysterious book. It is a mysterious book, isn't it? But regardless of how you feel about it, it's vitally important that you pay attention to this message. Have you looked around you and see what's going on in the world? Does it feel like we're living in the end time? Does it feel like we are? Yeah. We're close, aren't we? But you know, the, the end times began. You know when the end times began? The moment Jesus ascended to the Father. That's when the end times began. And we're still living in them today. Because Jesus could come at any moment. And I hope this morning as, as we're contemplating what's going on in the world, that you're ready to meet your Lord and Savior. You need to be. If you're not, you need to be. The devil, which we're about to read, read in just a few moments, is very real. But I'll tell you something. We're living in some very scary times. And if you can't see Satan's handprint in a lot of what's going on, then you're blind. And if you somehow have been seduced into thinking, well, the devil's nothing but a little fairy tale, I'm, I'm telling you, I'm telling you what, you've been seduced by the lie of heaven. I mean the lie of hell, not heaven. Heaven would dare you that day. <coughs> but Satan's real. The devil's real. The Antichrist is real. And their times are very near. Very near. From the time John penned this letter on the Isle of Patmos to today, Christians all over the world have suffered persecution. Matter of fact, Jesus made it very clear to his followers that they were going to choose to follow him that they would suffer persecution. And some of them would even suffer death like he did on the cross. Do you know that that's the terms that we signed on to whenever we decided to follow Jesus? You know that Jesus made it very clear that he, the Lord, was persecuted, that we, the servants, would also face persecution? if we chose to follow him. That, that's pretty tough language, isn't it? But I'll stop and think about it from, from just, for just a few moments. From the time that John penned this letter on the Isle of Patmos into the day, Christians all over the world have suffered persecution. In John's day, there was Nero and the Mithitan. Now, they were the worst persecutors of all of the Roman emperors. They were horrible. Under their reign, hundreds, thousands suffered and died simply because of the Christian faith. And the same holds true today. You and I are very blessed because we live in a country, a free country, that allows us the expression of a religion. But that's soon coming to me. And as, as you and I are aware, and we look at the things that's going on in the world today, you, you think about it for just a few moments. If you live in North Korea and profess to be a Christian, you signed your death warrant. If you are in Iran and you profess to be a Christian. You just signed your death warrant. If you live in Somalia, 
or many places or many countries in Africa and you profess to be a Christian, you would experience <laughs> tremendous persecution and even death. Now, is your faith real enough to trust in Jesus to that point to follow him? You know, we have an easy faith and easy believism here in America, but friends, I want to tell you something. Sometimes God calls us to the ultimate sacrifice. Sometimes God calls us to the ultimate sacrifice. But guess what? When we follow him to the ultimate sacrifice, we also get the ultimate blessings that he has prepared for us in his glory. This life is not what it's all about. This life is like a drop in the ocean in comparison to, to eternity. We have to suffer just a little bit in this life, but then when we get to eternity and spend eternity with him in his glory and all the things that he has prepared for those who Who's benefited? It's ours. And those which we influence along the way. As God reveals to John the vision of Revelation, he sees God. John begins to see God's plan unfold, unfold for the redemption of the world. And it's hard to understand. It is. Why the suffering? Why is evil so dominant? Why is God allowing this to happen? We may never know the answer to that question. But you know, when we get to heaven, we get to glory, it may not even matter for what we're going to experience when we get there. But friends, we can be assured of this thing. That God is just God is righteous. And he assures us through his word that every wrong, every wrong is going to be made right. Especially in his great and fearful judgment day. As Christians, you don't have to worry about that. If you're saved, your sins have been judged, and paid for a cross. But if you're not, what will it be like on that fearful day when you have to stand before God? Uh, Hebrews 10, 29 says, It's appointed unto men who wants to die, and then the judgment. Well, stop and think for just a few moments. Are, are there things in your life that you have never dealt with, that you never went to the cross about and said, Lord, all of our sins can be forgiven. Past, present, future, just like that. By coming to the Lord and saying, Lord, please forgive me, a sinner. Come into my heart and change my life. And He'll do that. And you never, ever, ever, ever have to face those sins ever again. Some of the consequences we might have to live with it. Those sins are forgiven all, immediately when you ask God to forgive. The Bible says we confess our sins. He is just and righteous to forgive us from our sins and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. He gets rid of the stuff. He gets rid of the, of, of the sin germ in our life. Why was Christ slain from the foundation of the world? Why was Christ slain from the foundation of the world? I want to ask you that question. Have you ever pondered that thought? God, if, if you knew how bad that we were going to be, how bad this world was going to be, why? Why would you even create it? Because of you. If you go back to Genesis and you look at Genesis, when God created this world, it was good, wasn't it? It's a wonderful thing. And it said that all, seven, all six days of creation, and the, and, and the Bible, the Scripture says, and it was good. It was good. It was a wonderful place. It was a great place until Adam and Eve fell in the Garden of Eden. They allowed sin to come in. Because of sin, we became sinners. Sinners 
by nature and sinners by choice. God had something planned. He knew that we'd break and tear up his, his beautiful world. He had something planned. And although God allowed evil to exist in his creation, he planned from the beginning the remedy to overcome evil. He planned a remedy to overcome evil. Notice how the Bible is descriptive of evil. Look at verse 1. And the dragon stood on the sands of the seashore. And then I saw a beast coming up out of, out of the sea, having ten horns and seven heads. And on his head were ten diadems. And on his head were blasphemous names. And notice how the Bible depicts evil. It calls it a beast, a dragon, antichrist. All these terms are used to describe the, the character of, of, the, of evil personified. Evil is deadly in its nature. But stop and think for a minute. Isn't it amazing how people are infatuated with evil today? I never thought that I'd, I'd be living in a day that, that good would be called evil and evil called good. But is, is that not displayed all around us today? It is, isn't it? Now, I want you to think about, you know, what, what our world is experiencing here, even in, 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 in evil land. Think about all the sexual perversions that are taking place. Homosexuality, bestiality, pornography, incest, child abuse. Now, friends... Can you not step back and see how evil this stuff is? God never intended this to be a part of his world. But it very well is. Why? Because Satan is the prince and power of the air. But you, you think about the sexual world. Think about the disrespect that we're experiencing today for authority. It's, it's sad. You know, Brother Cliff, from time to time, will stand in a pulpit and, and report to us how many first responders have lost their life that week. Isn't that sad? The Bible says that God has put those people there, you know, for our good. But yet we just respect laws and authority today. Like, it's, you know, like, that doesn't apply to me. We don't respect authority, you know, even children with their parents. You know, it breaks my heart sometimes to, to see how children respond to their parents. Like it's, you know, like it, uh, it, it's almost, well it is, it's re unrespectful. The Bible says, honor thy father and thy mother. And it says a blessing that, you know, if you do that, you'll have long life. One place of respect that, that breaks my heart is the clergy. It's almost like people, men of the cloth, just disrespected. It's almost like a joke. Teachers, principals, Anyone authority, it's almost like it's like, like there has to be a challenge to it. Think about the murder that takes place. I read, I don't have the newspaper, I don't have a TV uh, channel. All I have is the internet. But I do have an app for Channel 3 News. I have an app for Dopin News. I have an app for uh, Mobile News. And it breaks my heart every time I open that app, that app. Somebody is shot, killed, raped, or murdered. Every day. Every day. Either in Mobile, Pensacola, Fort Walton, 
Crestview. All around us, somebody is being murdered. Either a robbery or, or either a, a domestic. Then I said, murder. Is that what we have in our hearts today? Isn't that evil? Is to take someone else's life? You, you think about the abortion that goes on. You know, here's, here's, a, here's a defense of life that, that whether, whether the, the person intended to or, or did not intend to, to, to get pregnant and conceive, here's an innocent life that, that somebody, quote unquote, has a choice to terminate. That's murder. Is that not evil? Think about the racism, the prejudice, the hatred. Man, I'll tell you what, I, it just amazes me sometimes how, how even church people can hate church people. And I'm wondering, where is the Christ in all this? In vulgarity? Oh my goodness. How can you stand and watch what's on TV today? Tell me how you can stand there and listen to your God's name used in vain. Does it not, does it not insult you? I cannot stand. That's the reason why I got rid of my cable TV. I cannot stand the vulgarity. I know when I was a teenager, not just a teenager, but a young adult, what came out of my mouth. And I'm very ashamed of that. But I am so glad when I got the dean, God gave me a new language. The language of heaven. Amen? Amen? And friends, that should be our language. The language of heaven. To bless, not to curse. And friends, if, if you're Christian and, and you're cursing, you're being a bad influence. So we need to ask God to take that away from us. Because it's a sin. It's evil. It's evil. You don't need to have any part of it. How do you overcome evil? How do you overcome evil? You can't overcome evil by the power of the Lamb. Matthew 5, 44 and 48, Jesus gives us this prescription to deal with evil. Now, there are times that we get sick, and some of us don't like to take the medicine, do we? And sometimes we think, we think, you know, uh, the cure is worse than the cause. And I want you to listen to what Jesus, Jesus' prescription is. Because you may not like it. But it works. That's what he says. But I say unto you, love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that, that hate you. And pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be the children of your Father which is in heaven, for he maketh the sun to rise on the evil and on the good, and sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love them which love you, what will the Lord have you? Do not even the publicans the same? And if you salute your brother only, what do you more others? Do not even the publicans so? Be ye therefore perfect as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. Wow. <laughs> so simple and profound, but sometimes so impossible. Why did I say that? You think about how you feel towards your enemy. What are things in your heart that's keeping you from loving your enemy? And that self is exalted there, and he, and, and he or she will not allow it. In other words, in order to be able to love the enemy, those self has to die. He has to be put to death. She has to be put to death. And Jesus has to be resurrected in your heart. That's the way we love the enemy. Do you know when Jesus died on the cross, he even died for that man who was holding the hammer and hitting that nail and 
thing I showed you, Jesus. <clears throat> he even died for that Roman centurion that was taking that rip, whip, throwing it around his back and pulling it, and his skin ripping off. You know what Jesus' words were on the cross? You know what, what Jesus, some of Jesus' last words were on the cross? What were they? Do you remember them? Father, forgive them. Father, forgive them. That's Jesus' remedy for evil. Love the enemy. Why was Christ slain from the foundation of the world? God in his infinite wisdom and mercy saw that you and I needed Jesus. Notice what it says here in, in, in verse 10. And, and I want you to pay very close attention to this. In verse 10. If anyone is destined for captivity, to captivity he goes. If anyone kills with a sword, with a sword he must be killed. Here is the perseverance and the faith of who? The saints. Who is that? That's you and I. That's you and I. What, what, what do you mean, God? Have you got me a sign for a slaughter? You know, this, this verse has always puzzled me. You know, a couple of weeks ago, I, I preached on Acts chapter 1, verse 8, where Jesus said to his disciples, you know, go to Jerusalem, wait there until you be endued with power. If you'll notice the preceding verses above, and it says, and power was given unto the beast, and power was given unto the dragon. And power was given. Where did they get that power? Friend, they can't produce it on their own. You know where they got that power? God allowed them to have that power. Now, I want to, I want to, I want to share something with you that I hope is true. This scripture in verse chapter 13 is in the setting of the tribulation. Now, as a pre trib Premillennialist. I won't get into all that. But I believe that, that one day the church is going to be raptured and we're going to be taken out of here before the worst of the worst really gets here. But still at the same time, God never said to us that we were not protected or that we were not protected from being persecuted. So regardless of whether it's in the tribulation period or whether it's in the period which we're in, some, some of us may have to go through some very extreme ordeals in our life. And John is saying, and this is the perseverance of the saints. Friends, this is where your faith comes into play. This is where it's put to the real test. Is it really real? You see the, the persecution and the faith of the saints. Uh, why? For judgment. Because of the fallen world will face the stake. Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 7 and 10 says this. Blessed is a man that trusteth in the Lord, and whose hope the Lord is. For he shall be a tree planted by the water, and spreadeth out her roots by the river, and shall not see when he cometh. But her leaf shall be green, and shall not be, and, and shall not be careful in the year of drought. Neither shall cease from yielding fruit. The heart is deceitful above all things, and desperately wicked. Who can know it? I, the Lord, search the heart. I try the reins, even to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruits of his doing. What's in your heart? Do you even know it? What's your heart capable of? There's coming judgment. And 
friends, that judgment is going to sort out who is God and who is not. As you read Revelation, you'll find where God's witnesses are sitting under the altar or before the altar and they're crying out, God, how long? How long? How long will it be before you judge? There's a judgment day coming. Evil can do, evil is going to do, evil is going to be what evil is going to do, and evil is going to be. You and I, because we live in this sinful world, are subjected to it. But friends, let me assure you this, regardless of what evil dishes out to us, one day, evil will face its judgment. And lastly, you could be a witness. Do you know that God allows you to go through what you're going through because somebody may be watching? Other people may, may see, you know, through your faith, through your perseverance, what nothing else could have ever reach their cold heart. Because, friends, as you and I know, that, that we, we humans can harden our hearts pretty good, can't we? We can get pretty hard and crusty and bitter through new life's experiences. But you know, it's amazing to see how some Christians go through, through things and are so humble and thankful and how the witness is always true Regardless of what they go through, their faith is so strong in the Lord Jesus Christ. That has an impact on people's lives. Sometimes God allows us to go through that. Their witness might be true in people's lives. Uh, I read uh, in my research uh, about how God used Christians of the Roman state. There was a there was a Roman record from Thaticus. Uh, it was it was derived from his annuals, which was uh, recorded in uh, 1444, and it reads like this. And this is talking about Nero and how Nero treated the Christians of his day. And it said, and so to get rid of this rumor, talking about when you, you heard those saying in Nero violin while the while the city of Rome burnt. Well, you know who, wrote, who Nero blamed the, the burning of the city on? The Christians. But this is what it reads. Nero set up, set up as the culprits and punishment with, a, with the utmost refinement of cruelty, a class hated for their abominations who are commonly called Christians. Christus, from whom their name is derived, was executed at the hands of... of Procurator Pontus Plate in the regions in the reign of Tiberius. Check for the moment this pernicious superstition again broke out, not only in Judea, the source of, of the evil, but even in Rome, that, re that receptacle for everything that is sorted and degraded from every quarter of the globe, which there finds a following. According, accordingly, a resident was first made of those who confess, that's the being Christians. Then, on their evidence, an immense multitude was convicted, not so much on the charge of arson as because of hatred of the human race. Besides being put to death, they were made to serve as objects of amusement. They were clad in hides of beasts and torn to death by dogs. Others were crucified. Others set on fire to serve to illuminate the night when, when daylight fell. Nero had thrown open his grounds for the display and was putting on a show in the circus when he mingled with the people in the dress of a charioteer or drove about in his chariot. All this gave rise to a feeling of pity, even towards men whose guilt merited the most exemplary punishment. For it was felt that they were being destroyed not for the public good, but to gratify the cruelty of an individual. Let me tell you something. You have to suffer for the Lord, especially when unrighteous people and evil is caused. There are some people who do pay attention. And my question to you is, why was Christ slain from the foundation of the world? He was slain for you and I. Because he loved you and I. He understood 
don't know what it'll do if it infects our community. We don't know. But we do know this. That Jesus loves us. And that He gave His life for us. And you can bet on this when you put your faith in Him. Regardless of what you may encounter in this life, He's going to take care of you. Do you trust Him with that? Every head bow. You're here this morning and never trusted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. I'd like to offer this invitation to you. Before the foundations of the world, before ever God even thought about creation, He thought about you. And He sent His Son, Jesus Christ. And I said, well, well preacher, I'm, I'm one in ten billion. God is a God. And if we could put God in our little matchbox, He wouldn't be much of God. But God is a God of God the world of God knows the beginning from the end. He knows everything in between. He knows even your thoughts and your heart and your mind here this morning. Who can know the heart? It's desperately wicked. But God knows the heart. But God can change the heart. He can change my heart. He can change your heart. If you'll trust Him this morning. And friends, I'll tell you something. When Jesus changes your heart, it's the greatest life-changing experience you'll ever encounter. It's a great, it's life-changing experience you'll ever encounter. Would you let him change your heart this morning? Are you encumbered with fears and worry? Would you give it to Jesus this morning? Would he take care of you? He waits for your response. As we stand and sing this hymn of invitation, as God speaks to you, would you respond to him? You come. Face them.